Amen, amen. This morning we're going to continue with Here I Am, Send Me series. Look at your neighbor and say, Here I am, send me. Isaiah makes this powerful statement in Isaiah 6 so powerfully after he gets an image of the goodness of God. He responds with, here am I, here I am, send me. And this morning we continue the series. If you missed the first part of this, do not worry. Each one stands on its own, but you can go back two weeks on our podcast and listen to it. But today I'm going to speak on dreaming with God. Someone say dreaming with God. I'm going to read to you out of Psalms 126. I've got my Bible, but I write it out as well. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Can you say amen? Then our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Amen? Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. And the psalmist ends with this prayer. Restore our fortunes, Lords, as streams renew the desert. For those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. Someone say amen. They weep as they go to plant their seed, meaning sorrow just happens for a moment. But they return singing with their harvest. God is not offended by big dreams. He's offended by anything less. Can you say amen? Never underestimate big dreams, bold prayers with God. There is is no precedent because all things are possible. Give him a praise before we pray this morning. Come on. Dreaming with God. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Father, we welcome your Holy Spirit in this room. We ask you to speak to us through your word. Lord, you know who's in this room. You know who will listen by podcast. Come, Holy Spirit, and give me life and breath and breathe upon this message and speak into the listeners that which I don't even say. Let none of us leave, Lord, unchanged, but motivated by the Word of God. In the name of Jesus, and everyone said, Amen. Dreaming with God. In 1981, a 27-year-old young man, I'm 62, so that's young, he went to church on a Sunday night in Southern California. He was bankrupt. His wife had left him. He was a cocaine addict. His electricity had been turned off in his house. But he walked to the house of God. And that night in the house of God, he was miraculously delivered from cocaine. Can I get an amen? Miraculously. He walked back home again because he didn't have a vehicle. When he got back into his house at 15391 Balboa Street, Westminster, California, he ran his druggies out of his house and began to apply the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. Once he got to applying the blood of Jesus, all the dealers, the shackers, the whackers, they wanted to get out of that house as soon as they could. Amen. Because there is power in the name of Jesus. Can you say amen? He began to dream with God. He began to say, here I am. Send me. For three years as an evangelist, he dreamed with God. He dreamed of a world where cocaine addicts would become preachers. Can I get an amen? Where the outcast and the misfits would become the mighty ones of the kingdom. He dreamed of prodigals becoming leaders and those who would lead others to salvation. He began to believe for the restoration of many. He began to dream. Are you ready to dream with God? Say amen. In 1984, a little girl, we'll call her little because she was super young, about 21 years old. She was healed. That's my story. I'll tell you about another time. But what happened when the Holy Spirit healed me after being three years from being divorced from Hank Davis, whose story I just told you, the Holy Spirit awakened me as he healed me of the inside, of insecurities, of fears, and he began to awaken my dreams. When the Lord heals you, he awakens you. Can I get an amen? And if you're at a point you don't feel awakened in this series to come, I pray the Lord will awaken every dead dream by the power of the Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen? You see, hurts had buried my dream. 
Shame had covered my dream. Fear had chased my dreams away. And the opinions of others had silenced my dreams. I present to you this morning, don't let the opinions of other people silence the dream that God has given you. If God gave it to you, it is from Him, and it shall be fulfilled in His time and in His way. Somebody give Jesus a big shout of praise this morning. God awakened this 23-year-old, I was 23, to dream again. One night in Texas, I was about five months pregnant with this beauty on the front row. We were preaching. I was selling tapes. He was preaching. And uh, one night, I woke up in the middle of the night in the empty parsonage that they had put us. And I heard my husband doing something he rarely did. He was wailing so loud and praying in another language he was in the half bath off of the bedroom, and I just laid there. I couldn't move. It was so loud and so holy. I don't know if you've ever tiptoed toward glory, but the glory was so intense and so immense. I just laid there and shook in the bed as I listened to him, not knowing what in the world was going on. As he laid there, the Lord had given him a vision, had wakened him in the night. He had showed him the dream of glory. He had shown him what we would understand later would be our entrance into the city of Cleveland, Tennessee. The Lord had showed him the color of the church we would start an eight-week revival in. The Lord had showed him, though we did not know that day, the color of the chairs, the color of the carpet. The irony was, this was all to be fulfilled, but the irony was, and wait for it, we were in a city of Texas called Cleveland, Texas. Come on, somebody. Give Jesus a hand clap of praise. I love it when you dream with God and he opens you up to believe in supernatural things. I'm going to tell you then this property, when it was going to be secured, Jesus, as I've told you before, met me out here when I was resisting him over this city. My husband had a firm belief it was this city, but I was like Los Angeles, Phoenix, Florida. I'll go anywhere but here. You ever said that? And I was out here kneeling in that dirt, long story made short and Jesus showed me himself only twice that I've seen him in that kind of vision he was so tall he reached into the heavens and he was reaching to the north the south the east and the west as before we knew Larry Lee's Terry one hour prayer will you pray that and he was pulling in the outcast and he looked down at me and he said how long will you resist me or will you dream with me Rhonda will you dream of a place that will be like a hospital to the hurting. Will you dream of a place that will train leaders to go all over the world? Will you dream of a place where the drunk can come in the front door and the addict can find healing? Will you dream of a place where the religious can be set free? Will you dream of a place who will open wide their doors and cast down the thoughts of religion and say, whosoever will come in the name of the Lord. Can somebody give King Jesus a praise? And we began to dream. And I say to you this morning, Church of the Harvest family, the Lord has been asking me to dream with him again. And he's been asking me to say to you, will you dream with us as well? Will you dream? You see, what he has been saying to me is, you thought as a church you were going here, but you're going there. You had thought that the center of, of this that God was doing has already in place, but it's not. It's going to be far more reaching than you could have dreamed. I want you to dream with me, says the Lord. We'll get to this in your personal life as a church that there are enough benefactors. My chief elder, Pastor Billy, tells me all the time, people will flock toward a vision like yours. People will give to a vision. They don't want to give to a man or a woman. They don't want to give to an idea, but they will give to a vision to open wide and let the outcasts come from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Would anybody like to dream with God for that which is to come? Give him a shout of praise. Because his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, says the Lord. 
says the Lord. Newer imaging has shown that the older we get, the center of our cognitive gravity shifts from the imagination right brain to the logical left brain. If we're not careful, though, we'll stop living out of imagination and we'll start living out of memory. I'm speaking this to you as individuals and I'm speaking to you as a church and I'm speaking to those who are listening by podcast. Instead of creating the future, we start replaying the past over and over again. I thank Jesus for everything he's done and we want to remember his vintage miracles, but I don't want to live by the past. I want to see God create the future. I don't want to live by logic. I want to live by faith. I don't want to stop going after dreams and stop circling our Jerichos and stop commanding the seas to part and stop rebuilding the walls. I want to say I'm a candidate to dream with God. However far you want to dream, most high God, here I am. Somebody give him a shout of praise. This country was not founded by settlers. It was founded by pioneers. It was founded by people who crossed oceans and endured hardship beyond what any of us know in this modern world to make a country in God we trust where we could worship. This West Coast and the East Coast was founded. Some of us have watched documentaries. Some of us have watched Hollywood depictions of what it cost the people to settle the West. It is not for the faint-hearted. But these were people that were saying, I'm looking for something better. You see, one can be content in every circumstance, like the Apostle Paul writes in the book of Philippians, but also it was under the Holy Spirit's inspiration that the Apostle Paul said, I'm going to forget the things by behind me and I'm going to press forward to the things in front of me. I'm going to lay hold of why Christ lay hold of me. Can you give him a praise this morning? Come on. Look at your neighbor and say I'm dreaming with God. God is looking for some pioneers that will dream dreams regardless of your age, your creed, your color or anything. Why were you saved? Was it just to keep you out of hell? Well, I rejoice all day long about that. That's glorious. But there is more to you than you know. You were saved to fulfill a purpose of God. Neuroimaging and and, uh, those doctors that study that and those scientists can say whatever they want. But I'm going to hang Mama Linda with what the Word says. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith the Lord. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Everyone say all flesh. Your sons and your daughters, both male and female, shall prophesy your young men shall see visions your old men and women shall dream many dreams because i'm gonna pour my spirit out on all flesh somebody give him a shout of praise this morning when you dream with god he's called you to be an influencer there's been a lot of social media buzz about people hiring the wrong i'm not here for that today Hiring the wrong influencers and losing billions of dollars. Influencers are one that go on social media and try to sell you things. I'm telling you, it's getting so bad on Facebook and Instagram. I'm like Xing out so much stuff. I don't want to watch that. I want to connect with my people. Can I get an amen? I don't want to listen to a thing on what's my best sweet potato casserole. I want to bring the word of God to somebody. Can I get an amen? But I know some influencers, they make some big bucks from convincing you to buy a link, something off of their link. But the influencer that Christ wants you to be is for you to be a complete force producing effects and actions and behaviors and opinions in others. You are called to be an influencer. Be strong in the Lord. You are influencing more people than you can ever imagine because they forget to tell you. You don't get the follow-up. Your kindness, your relentless determination, Your love, your word of God for others matters. I told you about the young men at Walgreens. And I go to Walgreens about once a week. And I was in there this week. And again, he was just thanking me. And my son-in-law said at lunch that day, he said, and it's so interesting, Mama Rhonda, that he, you don't even know you affected him. That reminds me of you, 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 you. You don't know who you're affecting. Can you say amen? In a good way. Look at your neighbor and say, in a good way. But he grabbed me again. Thank you, thank you. And I just had to ask him, what are you doing here in this town? Where'd you come from? I just wanted to know. And he said, I came from up north. The reason he came, I cannot state because this is a podcast, but it blew my mind what he came to do in this town. Good thing. 
and a place of position he has. He just works at Walgreens to get a little extra money. And I began to think, Lord, that was just a troubled, young, beautiful African-American son to me that I just sensed with my ball cap on and my flip-flop on my tennis shoes and sweat pouring down my face from a greenway walk that was too strenuous to encourage. I'm going to tell you, you keep moving forward. For every person that tells you you influence their life, there are a hundred that will never be able to tell you. Never entertain the thought. Look at your neighbor and say, never entertain the thought that your life has no influence because you belong to the kingdom of Christ. When you walk in the room, the atmosphere shifts. Come on, somebody. Because you're a royal carrier. Jesus had a radiation zone. When he stepped on the country of the Gadara, the demoniac came running toward his feet. Why? He had a divine radiation zone. The Bible says you have Christ, the very hope of glory in you. As my husband used to say, we're called to be a thermostat, not a thermometer. When you go into work this week and everybody is grumpy and mad, and you th- I've done that for a I'm just going to be mad too. I don't know what they're all mad about. But I'm going to get mad too. And if we're going to be bitter, let's just all be bitter together. Let's form a bitter group. But instead, you be a thermostat that says, I'm going to change this atmosphere. I'm going to bring Christ into this room. I'm going to do it because I belong to the kingdom of Jesus. Here I am, send me. Someone give him a shout of praise. Will you dream with God, Abraham? Go count the stars, Abraham. You know, Peggy, I have to believe that I've been here. The stars begin to haunt him. God ever made you a promise and the very symbol he gave you begins to haunt you? Like, I don't even want to know that exists anymore. It's been so long. I wonder sometimes when he went out at night, if the stars didn't haunt him. That was the very symbol of what God had said. I wonder, but at one point or another, at some time or another, God's dream seeped into Abraham's heart and he began to dream with God. God is a dreamer and he's looking for people who will dream with him. In every generation, dreamers have arisen and they're going to rise now. They think outside of man-made boxes and dare to forge ahead. Who will dream with the Lord? Give a shout of, I will, I will. Say, I will this morning. Amen. Look at your neighbor again and say, dreaming with God. And dreaming with God, don't be a weapon formed against yourself. A man of God told me in about 1998, God can protect you from everything around you, but he can't protect you from yourself. You're your worst enemy. You're your worst enemy. You see, God will protect those things around me, but you've got to do a self-check occasionally and make sure you're not the weapon formed against your own self that's causing you not to prosper. Are you being so hard on you with a fear that torments you? Don't join the enemy of your soul and be a weapon against yourself. Dream with God. You are an influencer. Tell yourself, I'm not going to join with fear and sabotage of bully doubts and this, that, and the other. But I'm going to say, I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who saved me. Can I get an amen? Listen, you can win with a hand that you've been dealt you can with the imperfections you have with the position you have or you don't have with the age you have with the weaknesses you have with the appearance that you have with the circumstances you're in the middle of with the education you have or the lack of education you have with your limitations often I will send my daughters and they'll tell you this is true through Instagram one of those spirit filled people that have lost all their arms and legs and Nick is one of the great ones we've shown his videos many times here and he's preaching like a banshee he's traveling around the world but I get one little hurt foot and I don't think I can go on come on somebody things get a little hard and I don't think I can go on but here's Nick no arms and no legs given the kingdom of Jesus to others you and I have got to come to be convinced that regardless of who we are and who we are not who we are inside or outside here I am send me Lord Jesus somebody give him a shout of praise Romans 8 and 37 you know well but let me give you a little point on that as we move quickly through this message 
Paul, the apostle Paul said, can anything separate us? One of my, he's like, he speaks like a Philadelphia lawyer, and I wish I could just preach right here because I love to quote the whole thing. My daddy always says, he's a Philadelphia lawyer. He just steps up to the plate and just starts to make his point, and he slays it. But he says, can anything separate us? Can trouble, can persecution, can calamity, can any of these things, can heartache? No, in all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours. Say, it's mine. He said, for I am convinced, everyone say convinced, that nothing, and I'm going to get back to convinced, can separate us from God's love. Not death, not life, not demons, not principalities. None of these things, not even the powers of hell itself can separate us. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name. From Jesus Christ. You see, Paul gives a litany, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty five. 25. I encourage you, not just us preachers, we do this a lot, and pastors. Next time you feel like I got too much on you, go read 2 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, where he gives a litany of everything he's ever gone through. I mean, you want to talk about a list of head out opportunities? He's got it. You want to talk about a list of I quit? He's got it. You want to talk about opportunities to bail? He's got it. But he says, I am convinced. Say it with me. I am convinced. Where did he get that from? John 16 and 8, Jesus said to his disciples, when I go, the Spirit of the Lord will come, and he's going to reprove you, follow me, and he will reprove you, reprove you, correct you for the world of sin and of righteousness. Now, first definition in the Greek of reprove is convict us, which we thank him for his conviction. But second is so powerful in the Greek. It means to convince it means the Holy Spirit came on the scene to convince the Apostle Paul, you're not done yet. It meant the Holy Spirit came along and said, and says to you and I, when you're sick, I will heal you. When you feel forgotten, I will show you I will never leave you or forget you. When you feel like you're in the wilderness, I will show you I'm carving something inside of you. The Holy Spirit will not be, he will not be detoured. He will not be turned back. He's in the world to convince you and I to dream with God despite what you are, in spite of what you don't have, to dream with the most high God. God, he keeps showing up like a bad relative you want to leave. Come on, somebody. But he's the holy third person of the Trinity. Somebody give him a shout of praise. Come on, you could do better than that. This is the golfing championship taking place right now. I'll smile at you as I get on to you. How about that? I make you talk back because you learn. Holy Spirit is to convince you that you're still in need of a Savior. You're still in need of love. You're still in need of deliverance. He's here. I'm going to tell you something that a rheumatologist, which is an arthritis doctor, they study all kinds of things. I had to see them because of some problem in my feet. X-ray showed nothing was there, just too much walking, too much running, too much wearing high heels in my younger days. Glory, glory. But at any rate, she called me with some results. Young woman, but she, you know, I, I like to talk to people. And even there when I was getting my blood and going through all that, I kept saying, here I am, Lord, send me. Every next technician, I kept saying it, Lord, here I am, send me. And it's funny how they'll just pour their heart out to you. It's funny how they'll just start talking to you about things. But she said something to me at the end of our conversation the other day that I shared with Susan. It meant so much to her and I. But she said, um, Miss Rhonda, she said, I want you to know I exist on this planet Earth for you. Whatever you need, I'm here for. And I'm telling you, I thought that was a great statement. She didn't have to say it. It wasn't because she thought I was cute. Probably she thought I was crazy because I'm a woman whose word heals too many. Come on, say amen for one of the women in the house. But what I love is the statement, Jesus Christ exists for one purpose, and that is for you and the world. And you exist for one purpose, and that is for Christ and his kingdom. Here I am. Send me, Lord Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. So in Zechariah 8, the Holy Spirit begins to convince a group of people. Can't give the back story, but this is a word for you today. It says, this is what the Lord says, and I've added some things in to fit your bill. All this may seem impossible to you to dream with God. For you feel small. You feel discouraged. You feel overwhelmed. You feel weak. 
you feel tired, you feel incapable, you feel not enough, you have physical situations going on. I totally Ann this morning who does my hair. If I wear a hat, that's because she's out of town, so pray she never goes out of town. But anyway, this morning we are sharing our joint issues, and I said, you know, at 90, I guess I'll be using poster board to see. Matt will have to hold them back there and um, all of that, but you know what? We're going to keep going on. Can I get an amen? It doesn't matter, but we might feel like we're not enough. But this is what the Lord says. Regardless of what you feel or you're facing in in your life do you think this is impossible for me says the Lord Almighty even when you and I feel small we feel discouraged we feel overwhelmed we feel weak we feel incapable and not enough and circumstances of life have a way just to come hitting at you hard just when you whack a mole on one can I get an amen another one pops up like well we took care of this but now this is coming now that is coming but God says even in that I am the Lord, and it's not impossible for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Even with that lack of that promise, Devin, that has not been fulfilled and has been waiting for so long, and the time has passed, he says, I am the Lord Almighty, which is Elohim, which means in addition, if you missed it, you plus God equals God size amazing stuff. Can you say amen? You plus God, you plus God. When you take God out of the equation in anything he's called you to do, you're going to feel overwhelmed. You're going to feel at your limit. But when you put back in the addition, it is God plus me, we realize nothing is impossible with him. Can I get an amen? Look at your neighbor and say, dreaming with God. Come on, dreaming with God. Dreaming with God. Nehemiah, let's talk about a couple of dreamers quick. Nehemiah dreamed with God. Cupbearer in Persia. Prisoner of Persia. He hears the pain, the shame, the lack of those living back in Jerusalem. And he feels his heart is broken with the things that break God's heart. Pastor Rhonda, how do I know that I'm dreaming the right dreams with God? What breaks God's heart? What breaks your heart? When you see it, you know that's what you've been called to be a part of fixing. His heart is broken. Listen, he is a poison taster. He's not a soldier, amen? He's a captive. He's not captain. He begins to dream with God, and he begins to rebuild Jerusalem. He begins to remove their shame and remove their stigma. Don't you tell Nehemiah when you get to heaven that you weren't in the right circumstances. Rhonda Davis, don't you tell Nehemiah when you get to heaven that you didn't have the proper resources. Don't you dare, because what he was was a so to the king of Persia and you are in covenant with the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Somebody give him a shout of praise. You can win with the hand that you've been dealt. Maybe you've not been as productive as you wished you had been. Some of that is subjective and I don't encourage telling those things. But maybe there's an area, I'm just trying to be your pastor this morning, that you have felt limited in. Maybe there's an area you feel like God rewards and there's an area you have felt limited in. When God wanted to dream about his people being in a foreign land, when God wanted to make his people remember their song they'd forgotten, Tanner, when they had hung their harps on the willow tree, he chose a eunuch. I'll keep it PG-13. He chose Daniel, someone who would never know what it was like to have his own children. Babylon took that away from him and made him a eunuch. Daniel did not let that stand in his way. He chose to have influence in another way. And he led many sons and daughters to the king. He brought kings to their knees. He didn't say in his heart, well, this has been taken from me and this hasn't happened. And I don't have this and I don't have that. What he said in his own heart, but in vernacular of Isaiah, here I am, Lord, send me. And Daniel dreamed with God. God and God did amazing stuff. Can you say amen? Give him a praise. I believe my mic, my thought, you decide. I believe that sometimes the greatest dreamers are those who have tasted disappointments. I believe that some of the greatest dreamers are those that have known the source of real grief. Those that were knocked down but not knocked out. 
those that have wounds that have been healed, but they still carry the scars. Daniel, at a time when elder men were wrapping a shawl around themselves and sitting in a rocking chair, Daniel was warring for the destiny of Israel, and he got them back, and he changed kings, and he brought a kingdom to its knees because a man said, here I am, send me. You are God's answer to the world. You are Christ's ambassador. He is making his appeal through you. God does it in the most unlikely ways and with the most unlikely people. Any unlikely person, just wave a hand and let the angels take a snapshot of you this morning. In the 1840s, 50s when slavery was hitting America God had a problem his beautiful children of color were being beaten I'm going to tell you something God's children are not for sale can I get an amen you want to see God get ticked put any of his children at any age in bondage even when he disciplined Israel in the Old Testament and an, an, an arrival army would come against them he would point back to the enemies and say you overplayed your hand you went after for my people more than I'd wanted. Now, says the Lord, I'm coming for you. I wish I could preach this because I'm going to tell you, people in bondage, God is coming for them. Those that are under the spirit of oppression, our prodigal sons and daughters and grandchildren, God is ticked. God's children are not for sale. They do not belong to the enemy. They are children of the most high king. Somebody praise him. Somebody praise him in this house. God used an unlikely woman. Her dad was an orator of the day. He was so well known, Lyman Beecher. They said his mantle passed to his son. Well, they were so wrong because it passed to his daughter, Hattie. One Sunday morning in a worship service communion, probably didn't think anything was going on, just one of those Sundays. Spirit of the Lord began to give her a vision. She saw a slave being beaten beyond recognition. She could not stop crying. She had an open vision, a trance like Peter experienced in the book of of, of the Acts. And she walked her children back home. I love this. She walked her children back home, set lunch before them, but couldn't stop crying. She went back into her room and got out all the paper that she had. And she began to write. She said, God gave the words. I merely wrote them down. God is looking, I'll finish this, for some people that will say, give me the words, I'll write it. Come on. Give me the heart, I'll do it. Give me the open door, I'll be that person. Someone say, here I am. Send me, Lord. And she pinned, and when she ran out of paper, she grabbed grocery bags from the shelves and wrote the rest of the chapters on grocery bags. January 1852, a year later, uh, the 45 chapter manuscript that she said God wrote, she merely penned it, was ready for publication. And the publisher said, We won't even sell 3,000 ever of this. On the first day, it sold 3,000. On the next day, the entire printing was sold out. Uncle Tom's Cabin changed the trajectory of America. In fact, no novel has ever had a greater effect on the conscience. Had he met President Abraham Lincoln, who is purported to have said, so you're the little woman that started the great civil war and freed the slaves from slavery. God is looking for some people that will say, I have a dream of removing chains. I have a dream of removing oppression. I have a dream of removing fear. If that's you, give Jesus a shout of praise this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We wonder if I have this dream, will will the provision come from? The Bible says in Philippians, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. I've been studying benefactor and been studying the word because that verse means a benefactor. It means if it's God's will, it's God's bill. Say it. If it's God's will, it's God's bill. Say it again. If it's God's will, it's God's bill. And I love that Bill Johnson, the founder of the uh, pastor of Bethel, just told this greatest story. And he has a family reunion, and he was not one that ever wanted to dance. In fact, he said he told his sixth grade teacher it was against his religion, which it was, because he thought it's the most embarrassing, awkward thing he'd ever seen. And they had a big family reunion, 48 pastor missionaries, 160 from all over the world. I mean, this is a family reunion like I've never heard of. They studied the Old Testament, Zephaniah. Come on, somebody. And they scheduled a night for square dancing. Someone say square dancing. 
And his wife said, what are you going to do? He said, Benji, you know I don't dance. I don't dance. It's awkward. It's humiliating. I only dance in church. He said, I'm known to be stubborn. He said, I'm known to be unmovable. I call it committed. There's your good one. Next time someone says stubborn, just say, I'm committed. I'm just committed. I'm not stubborn. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm committed. I'm not stubborn. He said, I'm known for not having my mind changed. He said, but when my 10-year-old daughter unexpectedly got in front of me and said, Daddy, will you do si do with me? <laughs> Which is what they say in square dancing. do si do grab your partner. Okay, I'm not going to do it for you. Anyway, will you dance with me, Daddy? He said to his horror, his feet were firm. His mind was firm. But to his horror, he said, Yes, I will, baby. And he got up and do si doed with her, stepping on feet, all kind of crazy things happening all over the dance floor. But every time he thought I'm an idiot, he looked into the eyes of his beautiful 10-year-old girl. I want to tell you, you have a heavenly father who's a lot greater than Bill Johnson. And he sees us as sons and daughters that say, oh, but daddy, I need this provision. I need this. Will you do this for me? Daddy, will you take care of this? Will you meet my needs? And even greater, God is looking for children who will say, I'm going to dream with a God who's got all the provision and a cattle upon a thousand hills. Somebody give him a shout of praise this morning. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it so much. You know, this is what God does. He shows us how to dream again. I will tell you in this church, when we wanted this land, a church in California, a ministry in California had, had, knew they were done. They invested a lot of money to buy this 16 acres. And this church was built by that ministry. I want to tell you that every time we've gotten ready to do something, feed the hungry or minister the pastors, God has brought the provision. If it's God's will, it's God's bill. I want to tell you in the future that God will finance our next move, whether we build here or somewhere else. I know this, that God always has the provision. He can move upon a heathen king. He can move upon a banker. He can move upon someone that doesn't even come to this church and say I'm going to do it after Pastor Hank went to heaven two major worldwide ministries immediately sent money in wired money in to Word of Life Ministries to help us at my husband's home going local pastors that says a lot from on 30 miles west or east just started handing me checks made out to me we stand with you pastor we believe in you pastor I mean money kept being cashed out and Venmoed I thought Lord let this flow never end come on somebody because if it's God's will, it's God's bill. If you've not seen him come through for you, he will give him praise in advance right now. Come on. Amen. Queen for a day. Queen for a day. Every provision has always come from God. When it got time to do the work of the Lord, the Lord gave me a dream I can't go into. When we outgrew this facility, we outgrew it and Spirit of the Lord stepped in and gave me a prophetic dream I didn't even understand. I'll share it later. And it had to do with OCI. I didn't even know it was OCI. I'm going to tell you at every step of this church, the Lord has been faithful. And I can tell you that in the future, the Lord will continue to be faithful. Give him a shout of praise in this house. Come on, give him a shout of praise in this house. Hallelujah. And after you put that mic up, if you'd come help me, Josh, give Josh a hand. I've cut some of this out, but let me journey to the end, and I'll share the next week and several weeks. I am preparing this church for the future. And there's things that you'll have to listen deeply to hear, and then some things I'll say. I'm preparing us for the future. The fire is inside of me of what we are to do and where we are to go. I'm so far from distracted, I'd have to take something to calm myself down. Can I get an amen? And I'm not going to take anything to calm myself down. Can I get an amen? But God is preparing us, dreaming with God. Look at your neighbor again and say, dreaming with God. We're glad you're here this morning to dream with God. Just lift a hand and thank him for that right now. Just thank him for that and what he's doing. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you. We're ready to dream with you. We're ready to dream with you. Here I am, Lord. Send me. You can put your hands down. Whatever we do, there will always be provision, and God will back it up when we dream with him. 
we dream them. When I walk the greenway, a lot of times I have a, a, a vast imagination. I won't deny that. I've had it since I was a child. That's how I create dramas and sermons. But I always sanitize it under the power of the Holy Spirit. And often he'll say, let's dream the big dream. Let's dream the big dream. Dream with me, Rhonda. Bring church the harvest and dream with me. Because if you seek first the kingdom, all the other things will be added unto you. The problem is sometimes we seek the dreams. Seek the kingdom. In June 6, 1944, the allies of America and other countries, as you well know that day, started Operation Overload. One of my favorite stories, I've capitalized it, if that's, that's a word, I've summarized it. They took a small tohu, tohu, tohu fa bohu, that's a Hebrew word, that's not what they took. Let me get back to it. They took a piece of property. Everyone say a piece of property. A towhead is what we call it in Normandy. No one knew they were coming. I don't want to freak you out. But when Pastor Hank and I, I had a great story I'll tell next week of something when we were discouraged and a man of God came into our life. It's a powerful story that happened at a grocery store. But when we would get discouraged, we don't watch comedies. We'd watch Saving Private Ryan, Schindler's List. Lord of the Rings because it was a mission that people were going on. In the first few minutes of Saving Private Ryan is an incredible depiction though it is rated R for the violence and some people can't handle it. I, I get that. But they say the veterans that the depiction is so true of them trying to get out of those boats and being violently sick trying to land in Normandy. In one sense at the end of that day nothing much had changed. The vast majority of the world of Europe was still under the evil alliance of the swastika and Adolf Hitler. But the truth is, at the end of the day, everything changed. Hang with me. A tiny crack had been opened, and it kept getting larger every day. The allies would grow stronger, but they would suffer. But it was only a matter of time until Paris was liberated, France was liberated, and our dear brother and sisters, they're Jewish. Thank you. We're delivered from the concentration camps and the prisoners were set free. And then Hitler took his own life. Because I want to tell you something today, the beast will always be destroyed. Can I get an amen? The beast will always be destroyed. And then there was VE, Victory Day in Europe. VJ, Victory Day in Japan. The soldiers would come home all over the countries and the enemy had been defeated. But the initial landing of Omaha on Normandy by the Allies crossing those waters in peril to the final shot of World War II, there was a long gap. But truth was, victory was sealed on D-Day. It was just a matter of time. There was a baby born in the city of Bethlehem. Not many people knew who he was. Oh yes, the angel sang to the shepherds and the, he was born to a little peasant girl, not a princess. But the world continued as this God-man was formed and lying in a manger. But I want to tell you on that day, it was the beginning of D-Day for all humanity for everything changed the first crack was opened in the door and Zachariah himself said the morning light of heaven will break upon us and give light to those who sit in darkness I want to tell you Jesus paid a price we will never know Jesus took upon Calvary everything upon himself and on that Sabbath day his friends went to get his body but nothing much had changed Pilate was still in charge the priest and the rulers were still in charge Caesar was still reigning he didn't even know the name of the Messiah but heaven began to shout I'm going to tell you no one knew on that morning when the tomb was empty but a couple of women and the disciples but D day was complete the opening came wide and the son of righteousness broke through the heavens he is risen he is risen indeed somebody praise him in this house go ahead go ahead go ahead and praise him 
I'm done preaching. Go ahead and praise Him. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hang with me. There's a whole nother fourth of this sermon that'll be next week. It's all good. I'm still almost at 12. And last night, I didn't think I had anything over 10 minutes. But I, I want to tell you something. Jesus says, if anyone gives a cup of cold water in my name, that person will certainly not lose their reward. Here I am. Send me. Listen, this is your D-Day speech. When you use your resources, when you support the kingdom of Christ, when you wait on the Lord, the opening gets larger and larger. When you tell a prodigal you're praying for them, when you tell that weary soldier that works by you, you're thinking about them. It may look like nothing is happening, but the door is cracking just like the allies on Normandy, and the light is breaking forth. And I tell you this morning, the light is going to get stronger, and one day liberation will come. One day victory will come. It's only a matter of time. Can you give him the best praise you've given him? All morning. Come on. Can you give him the best praise? Hallelujah. Hallelujah.